What's so funny? <laughs> Why, Friday Follies, of course, right here on the Mutual Audio Network. <laughs> The following audio drama is rated R and is recommended restricted for anyone under the age of 17. Bam 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 Bum, 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 bum. It should sound exactly like that. Well, sir, I don't know if we have a chainsaw that sounds exactly like that, but I'll check our stock and thank you so much for using your impressive skills to point me in the right direction and fulfill my duties to this store and to you as sales manager. Sales manager, a helpful, friendly, and enthusiastic salesperson who works the floors of a major department store in a sprawling suburban shopping mall. But by night, he isn't because the store's not open. But by day, he is because... Because he's sales manager. Yeah, sir. Yeah, I, no, we don't. I, sir, I can assure you, we don't. We don't sell those. No. Yes, I know they were in the circular this week, sir. But we don't. No, we just we don't carry televisions here at this branch because they're just they're not very popular. I'm afraid. You were here yesterday and they were on the shelf. Well, that would have been our last day, sir. We just yeah, we just they were very unpopular. And we're not going to sell them anymore. Yes, I understand, sir. Okay. Well, when you do, tell the head of complaints that Mason Welt said hi. Yeah, thanks. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye now. It's a good thing I'm a people person. Oh, I hate my life. I hate my job. I work for a big fat freak. Do, do. Mason! Ah! <sighs> you have to help me. Don't ever do that again, Greg. <laughs> Mason, listen to me. There's an absolutely insane man over in the sporting goods department who's made an... An outrageous request, and I have to honor it on my word as sales manager. But God is my witness. I don't know what to do. You have to help me, Mason. You have to help me. Let go of my jacket, Greg. <laughs> Sorry. I just Now, what did he ask for? He, he asked me for... He asked me for a pair of salmon-covered slacks. I mean, he's... Mason, I pride myself on being able to fulfill everyone's request at a department store of this size. Greg. But pants made of fish? Who's ever heard of such a thing? Greg. What do I do? I, maybe Greg. he's been sent from the head office to trip me up. That's it. Oh, one of those bastards Greg. over there. They're trying to throw off my perfect record. I just know they are. Greg. I, what? I, I, have you ever heard of such a thing? Do I make them? Maybe they're down in, in the food department with the with the cheese. I just... What, Greg. Mason, what do I do? Greg, are you sure he didn't say salmon colored slacks? No, I'm sure I heard him right the first time. Then no, Greg, no, we don't carry any fish pants, I'm afraid. Then help me build a pair. Later that afternoon... So how'd the sales go, Greg? The customer didn't wait around for me to sell them. Well, four hours was a long time. Now I must wear these fish pants in shame and humiliation. Yeah, well, could you wear them somewhere besides my department? They're starting to smell a bit funky. Excuse me, sir, but I could not help but notice those fetching fish pants of yours. My cohorts here and myself are from the fashion industry, and we will pay top dollar for your amazing trousers. Really? Hold it right there, fashionistas. We're for the people for the ethical treatment of animals. We're appalled by those fish pants. What? Why, you animal rights bastards. You mink killing scum? What? Just Get him! What? I, ah! Well, the fight raged on for hours and hours with both sides suffering heavy casualties and Greg having all of the clothes and body hair ripped clean off his back. Looking back, I can laugh at it now, but not nearly as hard as I did while it was happening. In the end, Greg was fired from his position as sales manager, and he didn't take it well. He cracked a bit and went off to the woods of Wisconsin, where he tried to satisfy both people in the fight that day by making fashionable clothing out of live animals. Last I heard, he was trying to make a three-piece suit out of muskrats. Well, that's my story. What do you think? Kid, that is the greatest story I have ever heard in my entire life. I'm going to give you a big shot in this business. Now get out there and knock them dead. Here, just take this mallet, sneak up on them while they're not looking. A good whack in the back of the skull, that should take them down nothing. Thanks, JB. I'll do you proud. As for the rest of you, it's June 14th, 2006, and you're experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. Fish pants. Good, good, good God. 
Welcome back to the program. I am your host, Kaya and Chris Conroy, and you are, of course, listening to Technical Difficulties, the comedy podcast that's run done well by me. Here from the beautiful state of Minnesota in the city of Minneapolis. And good Lord Almighty, it's hot out there. Holy mother of God, it's going to be hot this weekend. I mean, it's it's not bad. I'm not a huge fan of hot, hot weather. It's in the 90s today. and uh, But boy, this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, 100 degrees. Doesn't happen that often here in Minnesota, but when it does, it sucks. And I'm going to be sucking on it all weekend, uh, thanks to our blaster heat wave and... All that kind of, boy, yeah, I'll tell you how it goes later. But uh, in the meantime, why don't we get on with the program and I'll catch you on the flip side. UFOs, ghosts, the paranormal, the Loch Ness Monster, Paris Hilton's popularity, all things beyond comprehension, all things beyond understanding, all these things beyond the known. With your host, Kevin Stock. And now, Kevin Stock takes you beyond the known. Hello, I'm Kevin Stark, and welcome to the program. The question that crosses every great philosopher and indeed every human's mind. What lies beyond the veil of mortality? Is there life after death? Well, my guest is doing research on that very thing. Professor of psychology and parapsychology at the University of Georgia... Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Ismir Kuchkokov to my program. Hello, Radio Land. Now, you've been doing a study about proof of life after death. Could you tell us about the experimentation and your research? Well, of course, everyone wants to know what happens after you die. You know, Even skeptics like Houdini wanted to know this and said that they would contact people after the grave. But to my knowledge, no one had ever done a true scientific study to prove whether or not the, the life happened, could continue, if the personality or the spirit or the ether or whatever continued after death. So I decided to set out and with my assistants to put together some kind of scientific study that would that would give us proof or not. And this was to be a purely scientific study. Then. Exactly. And we wanted this to, in the interest of that, we wanted to make sure that we had covered all bases. So the first thing we did was to set out and to see if we could prove the opposite thesis first. You wanted to prove if there was death after life? Precisely. Wouldn't that one be just a little obvious? Well, surprisingly, according to my research, uh, proof of death after life is purely anecdotal. Okay, so what... Uh, well, first what we needed to do was find a uh, volunteer who would uh, help us with the, uh, with the formulation of the experiment. And that is where my assistant Merrill here comes in. Um, that man is dead. Yeah, that's correct, yes. You brought a dead man into my studio? Dead assistant. This is the very valuable volunteer I was telling you about just a moment ago. Are you saying no. this man killed himself no, to be in No, 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 of course not. No, he didn't kill himself. No, no. Oh. His death was an accident. Now, um, he died while doing a Sudoku puzzle. Now... What we've learned in Hold it, hold it. I've never heard of anybody dying while doing a Sudoku puzzle. He was into extreme Sudoku. Very, very dangerous. At least two or three thousand people are killed every year doing the extreme Sudoku. You know, aneurysm right in the middle of a puzzle, dead. Uh, oh. I so see. we did a series of experiments once he had died uh, to prove that there was death after life. And, um, well, now we've documented it. I see. You've done the science community proud. Yeah, so we had a verbal agreement that in case after his death he would try to contact me by either mm. animating his corpse or winking at me, doing a little jig, moaning, I don't know, something like that. Um, and then I would sit and watch and uh, wait for that to happen. So how long has this been going on for? Two months now. You've been hauling around a putrefying dead guy for two months now? Yes, and I can say from experience that it's not nearly as amusing as Weekend at Bernie's was. Doesn't the smell get to you after a while? No, I just spray him with dead guy be gone once in a while. Dead guy be gone. A breakthrough in air freshener technology that actually manages to neutralize the smell of putrefying and or necrotic tissue. So the next time you have a corpse lying around just stinking up the place, go down to your local supermarket or mortuary and pick up a can of Dead Guy Be Gone. They'll smell better than when they were alive. Why do you keep spraying me with that aerosol can? No reason. That's better. How long are you going to keep beating those poor eggs? As long as it takes. As long as it takes for what? As long as it takes for me to get the white stiff enough so I can make a lemon meringue. How stiff do they have to be to make a meringue? The recipe says they have to stand up on their own like little mountain peaks. 
Well, do they? No, they're still in the omelet stage. How long have you been doing that? Six and a half hours. Why don't you just use the hand mixer? Because we don't have one. Yes, we do. Well, we did, but not anymore. What happened to the hand mixer? I had to give it to the military. I don't believe you. I think you are fibbing now. It's true. A man from the military came and asked to have our hand mixer. Why doesn't the military just buy their own hand mixer? She said it was national security reasons. They could track the receipt. Why must your fabrications be so unnecessarily complicated? Because it's my hobby, that's why. You don't see me tromping all over your hobbies like you're crocheting. I don't crochet. Well, I didn't say it was difficult. An excerpt there from Opacuity of the Ecliptic, the latest offering from American playwright Dale Sewards. And the latest in his Baker's Man cycle, it's being hailed as an existentialist masterpiece alongside such classics of the milieu as No Exit, Waiting for Godot, and Starlight Express. Mr. Seward is in studio with us today. Welcome to the program. How do you do? It's nice to be here. Thank you. Mr. Seward, this would be the fourth play in the Baker's Man cycle, Mm. the first three being Event Horizon, uh, These Truths, Self-Evident, and Eight Postcards from the Sun. That's right, yes. Um, Mm -hmm. All of these plays have a generalized theme, a particular symbolic... uh, Well, they have a a central theme that is symbolized by a pie. Yes, a pie. I put a pie in each of my plays, yes. Yeah, the main character, Trent, from Ace Postcards from the Sun, is obsessed with comp- perfecting his father's recipe for mincemeat pie, and in Event Horizon, the principal character, Sissy's innocence and purity in the world is represented, of course, by the by the mm-hmm. succulent cherry pie that is presented on a stool yeah. at the beginning mm-hmm. and the end of the play. Yes. Um, That's right, yes. Just... In this case, it's a meringue. It's pronounced meringue. Yes, well, this um, mar- this pie of yours, uh, why do you choose pies as a central metaphor? Well, I, I like pies. Mm. I, I don't think they get enough credit for, for being as tasty as they are. Hmm. And in each of the plays, it requires the actors actually create one from scratch on stage. Was there a particular reason for that? Well, uh, well it started with my first play of Horizon and thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had fresh pie at the end of the play? So I wrote it in. That's it, huh? Pretty much. And did this place any strange or undue requirements on the actors or anything like that? Well, they have to be able to make a decent pie right behind their ability to act, I suppose. Mm. Lovely. Well, next up on the program... Uh, i discovered have... I really like Cornish pastries now, by the way. Have you really? Yes. Uh, They're a type of pie, too, you know. Yes, I know. Yes. I figured I'd write them into my next play. Do you? Well, good luck to you, then. And now, mm-hmm. here's an all-new episode of Cop Beat. They've got meat inside them, you know. Yes, I know what's in Cornish pastries. Thank you. It was raining yet again in Los Angeles. You know, for the love of God, I can't figure out how a place that's known so well for its desert climate could rain this much. It's about to drive me completely insane. Every single night, rain pouring down the gutters, splashing in the streets. Yes, it washes the dirt and the blood and the memories away, but still, just this much rain is its unthinkable. Just like this case I was on. For weeks now, I've been investigating the murder of Alvin Tritt, extremely rich man who now had an extremely rich widow. No matter how I looked at this case, though, the pieces just didn't add up. It was like one of those jigsaw puzzles that you buy in a plastic bag from a thrift store where you're not exactly sure what the picture might be, but you have to kind of piece it together, and you're pretty sure your little brother was playing with it earlier, and 
you know, he lost half the pieces in the box because he was watching in front of the TV and he started kicking it around in a tantrum and your mom took his side because he's the baby and you're the middle kid and your older brother picks on you all the time and you get really, really bitter and decide to become a Los Angeles police detective so you can take your frustrations out on other people. Yeah, it was just like that. I was short on time, short on clues, and short on good tidings. And God help me, this rain didn't help at all. Although I have to admit, looking out at the Los Angeles skyline at night during the rain, it could be awfully pretty. Smith Tower, the Columbia Center, Two Union Square, Space Needle, Mount Rainier. That's when I realized I was in Seattle. Well, no wonder I was getting nowhere with this case. But at least I had an explanation for all the rain. Well, I better get driving. It's a long way back to Los Angeles. Wonder if I can get any coffee in Seattle. Cop Beat. True tales of the Los Angeles Police Department. Except for the parts that are complete fibs that we made up. Which would be all of it. And now, Cop Beat. The pieces to this case were all there, but they just didn't fit. They didn't make sense. Alvin Tritt was murdered when he was run over by a steamroller in a hit and run. A homicide. A steamroller very much like the one driven by his wife, Melvina, an amateur steamroller enthusiast. She seemed like the tailor-made suspect, but it was not to be. The evidence pointed instead at a 60s radical who'd been eluding the FBI for the last 40 years, who they called the Eunice Steamrollerist, a man who liked to run down environmental criminals as he saw it, a terrorist. One of the only survivors of the attack was Alice Ciccarelli, the beautiful, ravishing marine biologist who just happened to be the sister of our coroner. She was horribly maimed in the attack, her feet flattened like flippers, which served her well in her marine biology career, but left her so emotionally traumatized that she couldn't accurately describe the man who attacked her. So I was back to square one. There was something about this that bothered me. Something stank here. It, it didn't fit right, and it chafed my buttocks. I don't know what it was, though. And no, I'm not doing an underwear joke here, all right? So all of you grow up. No, the only thing I could do at this point, if I had any hope of catching the culprit, was to interview the last person who saw Alvin Tritt alive. A stage director in West Hollywood by the name of Batik. So, detective, I see you have absolutely no leads in Alvin's murder, then. Yes, and I'm completely out of exposition now, so I need to ask you a few questions. Such as what, Detective Merriman? Well, first of all, is Batik the only name you go by? No, detective, my friends call me Henri. H-E-N-R-I. No, 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 detective, it's O-R-N-E-R-Y. Uh, that I have a notoriously short fuse. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. My advice to you is don't ever use those enlargement pumps. They don't really work. Do you think I don't know that? Sir, I would never presume to think that I know what you know or don't know, sir. Well, I would think so, but I know I don't. Mr. Batik, what was the nature of your relationship with Alvin Tritt? What are you impugning, detective? I... That Alvin and I were lovers? Well... Is it so shocking to a person like you that two people from such different and disparate backgrounds could be drawn together from their mutual love of the theater? Is that such a stretch for your imagination? Mr. Alvin and I were just good friends. Hmm. Good friends who like to have hot orangutan sex, yes, but good friends nonetheless. According to his financial records, though, he was funneling quite a bit of money to you, Mr. Batik. Oh, detective, it was completely legitimate. He was merely financing my latest stage production. You can check my financial records if you don't believe me. I'll do just that. What was your latest stage production, by the way? My company was going to adapt My Fair Lady into a musical. My Fair Lady already is a musical. I know, I figured the adaptation would go very easily then. Hmm, sharp thinking. But it was more than the money detective. Mm. In Alvin's case, it was... Mm. It was his baskets. Mm? He wove the most beautiful baskets I have ever seen, detective. He knew all the techniques, twining, wicker, pleating, interlocked, coiling. One or three rod. Both. Impressive. I will treasure those baskets forever. There'll be no new ones. Oh, no new productions. All of that's gone. That bitch wife of his now has his fortune, and she had no love for any of his passions. Speaking of Mrs. Tritt and passions, was she aware of her husband's, shall we say, proclivities? Mm, I don't think so, Detective. He was very discreet about the weaving. I see. One more question, Mr. Batik. Did he seem agitated? Did he mention anything about some sort of vendetta against him? Maybe an environmentalist or something about a... Steamroller? No, Detective. The last time I saw him, he seemed very happy, just sitting there in the corner, naked and weaving and laughing to himself. Well, thank you for your help, Mr. Batik, but I may be back to ask more questions, so don't leave town. <laughs> Detective, where would I go? Somewhere besides town. Yes, well, I see you've got me there, Flatfoot. I molded over and over in my mind on the way back to HQ. It didn't make sense. His wife was the best fit for the suspect, but... Why would she kill him other than the money, I mean? I mean, that was a pretty obvious one, but she didn't necessarily need to do that. He already gave her a gilded life all the way she wanted it. 
and she knew all about his double life. I mean, with the basket weaving and all, I suppose that it... Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Wait, maybe if she had just found out about his gay side, maybe that would have set it off. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I think I heard something about jealous attacks like that. Ah, uh, oh, boy. Okay. Oops, my bad. I gotta go back and ask now. Ooh, <laughs> silly me. Uh, sorry, Mr. Batik, to bother you again, but I just had one more quick question that I needed to... Oh, dear. It was Henri Batik squashed flatter than an iron-on transfer by a steamroller. And there was a message this time scrawled completely across his chest in a sharpie. Your next detective. Well, things just got personal. Looks like no sleepy buys for Melman. Next week on Sleepy Buys for Mel... Next week on Cop Beat. Well, Melman, you finally did it. You went and triggered the apocalypse. I hope you're happy now. Yeah, well, what if I am? And there you have it. Thank you once again for listening to Technical Difficulties for July 14th, 2006. A very, very hot Friday here in Minnesota. And I've been your host, Cayenne Chris Conroy. Uh, that was a rather subdued episode, humor-wise, I think. I don't... Sometimes I don't know how these things are going to go out while I start writing them at the beginning of the week. And uh, and this one turned out to be, I, I, I think, a little low-key. But I don't know. I'll have to get your opinions on that. Which you can send to me if you contact me at techdiff, that's T-E-K-D-I-F-F, at gmail.com, where you can send me all kinds of comments, you can send me fan mail, you can send me audio if you'd like me to play it on the show, I haven't got any, com- I haven't got any uh, plugs or anything from people, if you just want to send me some your own little uh, goofy little bits you want to send me, you can go ahead and do that. And if you want to send me ideas for bum ba bum August's uh, Listener Activated Show, that's right. The end of August, the last week of August, is going to be the next listener sent me ideas that I turned into sketches thing. I've got a stack going already, thanks to some of you eager beavers. And if you'll uh, continue to add uh, on to that, I can go ahead and start cranking out some new ideas and putting together a new show, and, and it'll be all kinds of listener stuff. So I people seem to enjoy doing that, so please do. And um, by the way, I also make a point here. When I... When I complain about how the show is stupid or something i'm being self-depreciating which i'm not going to do anymore i got a comment over on itunes from someone who uh, seemed to think well they seem to think my show has jumped the shark maybe he's right i don't know but they uh, he complained that uh, i was saying that the show was half-assed but i didn't care about it anymore and that it wasn't funny and i had lapsed into inane leftist humor okay that's reasonable i suppose i mean you know if that's the way you feel about the subject but obviously uh Obviously, doing self-depreciating humor doesn't work. It's never really worked for most people, and a lot of people have said, you know, stop apologizing, you know, stop trying to get fish for people. And it's true, I might be fishing for people saying, oh, I'm not so good. Oh, Chris, we think you're really good. Well, you know, it's true. So from now on, you can refer to me as Cayenne Chris Conroy. Super genius. That's right. I'm going to be Mr. Super Genius from now. I'm going to capitalize on what a brilliant comedian I am. No, I'm not. But I, I'm going to ditch the whole sort of, I'm sorry, please like my show. Because obviously it doesn't get me places. I was trying to be self-depreciating and humble. It just got interpreted the wrong way, I guess. And also, by the way, if you're on iTunes, if you're registered with iTunes and you got an account there, please feel free to leave a nice comment for me or uh, drop a nice review or, or even a shitty review. I don't care. Go right ahead. Uh, about my show over at uh, iTunes. And I got a site set up on Podcast Pickle where you can vote. or And if you register there, you can add me to your favorites, which I think bumps me up somewhere in the registered, you know, sort of how many listeners are listening and, and where my rankings go. And also there's, of course, Podcast Alley if you want to give me a vote over there. I don't normally ask for people to do that, but... It, Excuse me. I don't normally ask people uh, to do that for me, but if you could, I mean, it would be nice, you know, to to kind of get up there where I'm visual, so people can, you know, where people can see the, my show in lights or in my name places, so that I could pick up some more listeners. But you know, no big deal if you don't. I've got a I've got a nice comfy level of listeners somewhere around the six to seven hundred mark, somewhere the up mid to upper six hundreds. That's pretty nice. I say tell that to people, and they're like, "Wow, that's a big audience." I don't even know what an audience size should be for a podcast, to be perfectly honest. So I stopped t- paying attention to that. But on the other hand, I'd like to get some work and some. Uh, I'd love to be a voice actor and a writer, as you all know. If you're new to the show, I've been wanting to do voice acting and writing. 
and other things among among filmmaking and cartooning and just a whole bunch of other stuff and um the, you know, I just thought the show would be a good advertisement for that. So if you can just talk it up, that'd be cool. If not, whatever. I don't care. I just, you know, vote, don't vote. Just enjoy the show. The most important thing is that you're all out there enjoying the show. That's all I have to say. Check out Uncomfortable-Questions, that's my wife Susan's podcast. And also check out, um, well, we haven't got a new, if you've been watching Channel Surfing Wipeout, we haven't got a new show up, but we're going to get a new one up there very, very soon because our numbers on Channel Surfing Wipeout are going ballistic. They're like 1,500 views for each of our shows now and we have no idea why other than the show as soon as we gave up on the show the numbers skyrocketed that's the universe's way of basically pantsing you I think and um, well I'm up to 25 minutes here as I see and hey you know I've got an idea before I go I'm gonna give you guys I'm gonna send you out on a little bit of music note but one little quick bit of trivia in the early sketch I did here, the very first one that happened in this episode called Sales Manager, there was a character who appeared named Mason Welt. That's W-H-E-L-T. And way back about, oh, I'm going to say about 12 or 13 years ago, I came up with a character called Mason Welt Retail Commando. That was a whole, it was a comic book idea. It was a comic book series about a bunch of characters who work in the world's largest shopping mall. Uh, it was going to be in the vein of a lot of the classic zany 80s uh, Japanese animation and manga uh, series like like Urusai Yatsura, if you know what I'm talking about. But this is an ensemble piece with lots of lots of slapstick action inside the world's largest shopping mall. Well, I've decided I'm going to adapt that to radio plays. So I thought, well, why don't I put Mason out there where you can hear him for the first time? And you hopefully I'll be getting on that very, very soon like I get on everything else in my life, which is usually never. But I actually plan on doing that one because that one seems like fun. In fact, I'm trying to take all my old comic book ideas and rework them for audio plays because audio plays are very effective and a whole lot fucking more easy to do than drawing comics, I'll tell you. Boy, that's hard work. Anyway, before I go, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of music. I've been goofing around with GarageBand. For my birthday, I got the... Um, Garage Band, uh, the World Beat Pack, and I came up with some interesting stuff that was in. There was it came with some interesting loops, and I also have some acid loop collections that my wife bought because she uses acid on occasion. And one of them was a sort of bluesy one, and I decided to combine world dance and blues. And uh, I think you'll like this. Uh, this one, this title is called "Tentatively Sneaking Whiskey into the Rave." So I'll uh, leave you with this. And uh, like I said, techdiff at dot com, techdiff at gmail dot com. Uh, uncomfortablequestions.com for my um, uncomfortable-questions.com for my wife's podcast and uh, channel surfing wipeout and uh, channel surfing wipeout.com excuse me and I'm I'm gone over all right great well I'll talk to you guys next week
Thank you for listening to Friday Follies right here on the Mutual Audio Network. Please consider subscribing to other days of the Mutual Feeds, including Monday Matinee for classic, live, and theatrical audio plays. Tuesday Terrors for horror audio drama. Wednesday Wonders, our science fiction and fantasy magazine. Thursday Thrillers for action, adventure, mystery, and crime drama. Saturday Story Circle for kids and families alike. And Sunday Showcase, bringing you the very newest in audio releases for the week from our United Artists of Audio, right here on the Mutual Audio Network. The Mutual Audio Drama Network, where we listen and imagine together.